Hey everyone, I'm Dave Otero and welcome back to the studio. So far in this series, we've covered the drum recording, bass recording, and guitar recording processes for the new Cattle Decapitation album, Death Atlas. If you haven't already checked them out, then head over to the channel after this video. They're pretty exhaustive. We cover everything from the recording gear used for drums, bass, and guitar to their individual instruments, picks, strings, preamps. I mean, we really just kind of covered everything. There's tons of information in there, and I think you'd find it interesting. The topic of today's video is obviously the vocal tracking, not just the gear, but everything from our communication, starting the project off, to keeping organized, to what vocals we decided to record first, order of operations throughout the entire process, and a lot of tips and tricks that you might find to kind of make your vocal recording go smoother, or maybe give you some insight as to how these sound as amazing as they do. Just a few weeks after we actually completed the album, Cattle was back in town for the Summer Slaughter Tour, and we had a chance to sit down, Travis and I, and just kind of discuss some of these techniques, kind of reminisce about the process as a whole, and chat about our history together, working as artist and producer, and really just went over a bunch of different topics. So when it's applicable, I'll be splicing in bits from that interview so you can get Travis's perspective on some of these techniques and kind of just catch a bit of banter back and forth between us. Yes, Mr. Otero. <laughs> so let's just take it from the top. Uh, obviously that starts before they're even out here in Colorado and that's just with communication. Uh, Travis is kind of one of my main contacts with the band anyway, so not only are we discussing, you know, travel plans and laying out a, a broad guideline of how the session's gonna go, but we're talking about his specific ideas for the new album, new styles he wants to try, things that he maybe wasn't pleased with completely on previous albums that we want to try and organize better or do better in general. So obviously there needs to be a level of communication before the band's even out here. So everyone has an idea of kind of what we're in for and there aren't any major surprises when the time comes. On some of the previous cattle albums I've worked on, I would have demos beforehand with some scratch vocals recorded. I could get a feel for the lyrics and patterns. On this album, I didn't really have that. Uh, Travis had a few spots that he had tracked just like on his computer by himself, but they weren't even remotely close to like a real performance. They were just kind of talked through. The next step would be demoing vocals for the entire album. If we were just to jump right into vocal tracking and start getting takes right away, then I'd be kind of flying blind without really having a contextual idea of how everything fits uh, over the song as a whole or the album as a whole. And I can't really guide the process uh, or honestly do my job at all if I'm just kind of making decisions based on this part right here kind of in an isolated situation. So I really need to have an idea of where the vocals go, what voices we're using for what sections, how we're doing layering, and have a chance to give my input on some of that things as far as patterns, pitches for the melodic section, and do that in an environment where we don't have the added pressure of trying to get album quality takes. So when we're demoing out across an album, we're just getting the ideas down. These are nothing that would end up on an album, but they get the point across and we're able to uh, talk back and forth through patterns and ideas in a more relaxed environment, both here in the control room, just holding an SM7 and getting our ideas down on tape. So we did that this time. We had we had our color coded Google Doc, um, and we went through. It took a whole day. Yeah, we and did we just the sat scratch. There, we sat there and did scratches for all the parts, yeah. and with you, me, right next to each other, just with an SM7, kind of like quiet versions. Yeah. And then at least we had like an overview, because yeah. to, for me to really do my job, I have to hear hear it all together. You know, yeah. because everything intertwines. You know, and that's the, you know, that's the, the bummer about the way we do it. On, for your end, I, yeah. I see your gripes. Um, this way it worked out. I mean, it, it was it's, like... It's really all about preservation. I mean, what good is having all, yeah. you know, all your stuff uh, in, pl in place or, or how you want it if the fucking take it, the voice sounds like shit, yeah. you know, or if it's the true. takes are crap. It's both. Lately, most vocalists have been showing up with lyrics on a computer and they're either reading off their phone or reading off a laptop. Rather than having them print those lyrics out, which I've done in the past, I've honestly preferred just working off of a shared Google document. I had Travis put all of his lyrics in a single document and share it with me, and he was all about the idea and actually we even took it a step further and color coded it depending on the voices he was planning on using, had it really well organized. Uh, which kind of gave me the opportunity to match that in my 
pre-production demoing. So it's kind of cool. He had a color key laid out for his lyrics and I just used the coloring options in Cubase to match those. And it was really quick and easy to visually see what voice a section was or what voice was to be used for a section. Or I could kind of use it to guide, figure out where I was in the song quickly. So that ended up being something that I kind of took from this project and I'll probably utilize in sessions in the future using a matching color coding scheme to keep more organized and keep everyone on the same page. That's a new thing we did this time was put lyrics in a, in a Google Doc that we could share. I've, always, I've had lyrics in me before, but I think you just emailed them to me and then we never had anything that was syncing. Yeah. Or a printer, I think we always, I've always used printed lyrics. I've had to go into there, in, in, into like your computer and go manually change them. Change you know? shit, this yeah. Fixed all of that. The shit. Google Doc thing was the best way, or whatever kind of syncing. Yeah, I don't know what other people do, but yeah. that's, I mean. That's we, the easiest one. There are a few other similar deals, but the fact that we're both looking at the exact same um, exact same text, you can make changes, I can make changes. We came up with like a color coding scheme that helped yeah. a lot for styles or production things, like, okay, these we need to revisit or whatever, or make sure not to forget these. Yeah. Uh, and it helped a lot just because of the way we did it, where we split up all your style. That was a pretty slick element too. When we did our prepo demos, our scratch tracks, I color coded those. I separated all of your voices on the different tracks and color coded them the same colors as you had in the Google Docs. So at least on my screen, you're not seeing that. But for me, that's what I need. The Google Docs is like, doesn't really translate to my timeline. Okay, I can see this, this block of vocals over here with like a timestamp. But that's not the timestamp in my project, and I can't automatically see where this is. Yeah. But if I have pre-pros, and I can see, okay, here there's four lines, uh, they're red, which means lows or whatever they were, I can look at my project and be like, oh, it's probably here, and then I can zero right in on it. So there are a lot of benefits of demoing the album out like this before we actually start tracking. One of the main ones as a producer is just gives me a good overview of the entire song and the entire album. So I can make assessments as we're tracking as to, okay, well, vocals should definitely be on this part, or okay, maybe this is a good spot to rest for four measures because the part before it and the part after it are pretty busy. I really just need to have that overview uh, as a guideline as we're going through and laying down real tracks. So I know where I am in the song, I know where the energy needs to be, gives me ideas for where layering and things like that could come into place. And then obviously it allows us to really just dig into those specific parts as far as patterns and lyrics and melodies in the melodic section. And we can bounce ideas back and forth in a situation where it's more relaxed. We're both here in the control room looking at the same lyric sheet rather than a situation where we're actually recording, doing multiple takes. There's an added pressure of trying to perform in that situation. So it's a little easier to do your first pass through an album in a more relaxed situation where you can talk through pattern changes and different ideas in a relaxed environment. There are always gonna be a few cases where you discover that you need more lyrics for a song or uh, vice versa, you know, maybe you have too many vocals for a certain section, you need to pare those down to give the song room to breathe. It's a better idea to kind of find out those situations before you're tracking so there's time for those lyrics to be written. It's not a forced thing where you gotta come up with a stanza in the studio and then perform it right away. It definitely helps to be able to give a vocalist time to compose those lyrics at their own pace and kind of when they're in the vibe rather than forcing it on the spot. So even though we'll track a scratch vocal across the entire album and we really have all the parts done, it doesn't necessarily mean that anything is set in stone. It's kind of just gives us a first pass at it. So we get all those initial ideas out of the way and more ideas are definitely gonna come up when we're tracking actual vocals. But if you can tackle that process in two or three passes, rather than trying to figure out everything as you're hearing it for the first time, you have a better idea of the song, you'll know the better product in the end. Another reason that necessitated having a full demoed out album was uh, the way that Travis wanted to record for this album in particular. In the past, he's experienced more vocal fatigue from certain voices, like his high vocals and what he calls his tongue vocals will uh, fatigue his vocal cords more than the lows, and the lows will fatigue them more than 
possibly the melodics or any of the cleaner styles. So he really wanted to record this album in a way that would allow his voice to feel fresh when we got to those specific styles. That meant starting with all of the melodic and clean vocals, and then moving from those to the lows, then the highs, and then you know an overview process, obviously, where we catch anything that we missed or do any layering that, that may come up. The fact that we do split up everything presents a lot of problems as far as we, that's probably what, one of the reasons why we took more time. I think we split up things more this time. I think maybe last time we did cleans and then we did highs and lows together. Yeah, we've always done that. And yeah. I've, I've always done that. I, I mean, this time I felt so good. Yeah. The, the, the lows just felt unlike any time they ever have. They just, it felt right. Yeah. And that's half the battle or more maybe. Um, so, so a part of that, part of the struggle of splitting it up so much is that. Um, oh yeah, that's the th that's what I was gonna say. I, yeah. I don't want to fucking. Go the lows are sound good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Stay on this. What if I fucking go yeah. and do highs? And then it and now all of a sudden I'm hitting those dead spots. And so it kind of that did happen when we were at the end of the process and we're okay. Now we're just fixing parts or changing parts or coming and we kind of got to bounce everywhere. We're doing melodics here. We're doing lows here. You know, it's just whatever needs to be done. Um, it did when you would do highs and it would it would fuck your shit up. And yeah, lows wouldn't sound as good. Now, vocal arrangements for cattle decapitation songs are extremely intense. There's lots of layerings. There's multiple different voices. I'm separating everything on different tracks and different folders. So keeping all of this organized is absolutely paramount, and that's where having essentially a blueprint of those demos is extremely important. So when you're only going through and doing specific styles through all the songs, it's really easy to lose your place. It's very difficult for me to make judgment on those sections without hearing the parts that come before and after them. So as we would progress through the songs and record real takes, we would slowly mute out those demo tracks, but I still had those scratch vocals surrounding those, you know, now finally recorded sections so we could stay in context and make sure we knew exactly where we were in the song and where each vocal section was fitting into the grand scheme. Basically, we recorded all of the cleaner and melodic vocals across the entire album first, and then went back and recorded all of his low death metal vocals, then went back and did all the high vocals, and some of those would just be layers for other parts. Uh, and then after that, there definitely was a a large amount of the process it was just listening back catching parts that we missed you know splitting things up like that some sections are inevitably going to fall through the cracks or ideas are going to pop up at that last stage so you definitely have to make sure to go back give full listens to all the songs take notes make notes and get anything that was missing or any final ideas that pop up make sure you get those tracked as far as gear for this album, we stuck with the Shure SM7B for all the heavy vocals, which I think we've used for all the vocals, period, uh, for the last two cattle albums. But being that there are some slightly newer styles of his melodic vocals in this album, some that clean up a little more than they have in the past, I wanted to try a different mic for those. So we actually went with the Slate VMS microphone and Travis immediately loved this. You know, there's a, a level of detail you get with a condenser microphone, specifically a large diaphragm condenser like this, that you just can't achieve with a, with a dynamic microphone like the SM7B. When he heard the extreme level of detail you get out of a mic like that, it allowed him to really dial in his voice and control it and get really the best performance that he's probably ever uh, given in the studio. The SM7 tracks went through my Universal Audio 6176 uh, preamp compressor combo. So that's a 610 tube preamp that goes into an 1176 style uh, compressor, and I was crushing it pretty hard. I usually have the attack set around four or five, depending on how much consonant I want to poke through. Uh, how, how punchy I want each word or each stanza to be uh, with a pretty fast release. So somewhere between nine and 10, pretty aggressively grabbing uh, in between those words and with a lot of gain reduction. Like I'm kind of pegging the needle, you know, if I'm, if I'm not pushing near 20 dB of gain reduction, then I'm not compressing enough in my opinion. Now I did buy one of the earlier Slate VMS models. So I do have the dedicated preamp they shipped with for a while. 
But honestly, these days, I've just been running it through my spider. Um, the Cranesonic Spider is a pretty clean print to begin with, so I don't feel like it's adding a ton of coloration that would throw off any of the emulations. Uh, but I did use the in-the-box mic modeling system, obviously, along with the Slate Stress Compressor for all of the compression for the cleaner styles. So one thing producers and vocalists don't often consider is how a microphone on a stand versus holding a microphone might affect your performance. For the cleaner vocals, the VMS obviously was on a stand with a pop filter, but on this album and I believe Anthro, I've had Travis hold the SM7B. I find certain vocalists can get a little more intensity and uh, holding a mic allows them to kind of work out some energy pacing around the room and uh, contort their bodies in ways to kind of get specific sounds. Whereas, you know, if they had to stand up straight on a, on a microphone stand, while that's great for traditional singing, projecting loud operatic style, um, it may be a little bit limiting uh, when you're trying to get some of the crazy sounds that, that Travis is trying to get. The downside to that, obviously, is that he practically ruins a cable uh, every album because he'll, like, just m turn it into a complete rat nest by pacing in circles for hours at a time. Sacrificing one cable per album, uh, it's, not the, it's not the worst thing in the world if it gives us a better performance. So I think that covers most of the vocal recording process. It was really intense for this album. You'll know when you hear it how many moving pieces there are and different voices and different patterns. And it was quite the undertaking. I think we spent upwards of seven or eight days on vocals. And by the end, both of us were just absolutely spent. But if you've done a good job and you can listen to those performances and feel absolutely satisfied in them, that tends to wipe away most of that. As always, subscribe if you're into the videos. Uh, I think after the guitar video went up, the channel jumped from about 600 subscribers to over 4,000 now, so that's really awesome. I'm really stoked that you guys are, are digging these so far. I really love reading all the comments, and I'm completely open to other ideas, obviously beyond this kind of album, many other studio tips you guys might be interested in. I'd love to hear your ideas, so please leave comments below. Like the video if you're into it. And I do really want to just give a special thanks to anyone who's subscribed so far and whoever's watching these videos. I'm having a lot of fun making them, and I'm, I'm really excited you guys are enjoying them so far. The new Cattle Decapitation album, Death Atlas, comes out on Black Friday of 2019. There's a link below to check out some material from the album and put in your pre-order, which I highly suggest you do. It's one of the albums throughout my entire career that I'm most proud of. It's one of my favorite mixes from anything in the extreme metal genre. I know I am, and I know the band is just really pleased with how the entire album came out, and I know you will love it. It's the perfect evolution of the cattle sound. I can't wait for everyone to hear the entire thing. Thanks for watching, guys, and I'll catch you on the next one.